SPJIMR Center for Wisdom and Leadership presents its podcast series Sapiens. It is about the practical aspects of a wisdom-based approach on leadership, various global and societal issues. Hello, welcome to Sapiens, a special podcast series brought to you by SPJMR Center for Wisdom and Leadership. I am Surya Tahora, Executive Director of Seawill, and today for the fourth episode, I will be in conversation with Howard Newsbaum. Howard is currently the director of Chicago Center for Practical Wisdom and is also the Stella M. Rowley Professor of Psychology at the University of Chicago. So Howard, uh, it's a privilege and uh, really a pleasure to have you uh, in this uh, series and this episode of Sapiens. And it's a pleasure because... Uh, you have been a source of inspiration for me with this Center for Practical Wisdom that you are heading in Chicago. And also because uh, you are like uh, supporting our activities by being uh, in the board of advisors. So really thanks again for being with us today. Yeah. Well, sorry, uh, thank you for inviting me and, and for your kind words and, and, and for the opportunity to have this conversation with you. I really appreciate it. Um, I have to say that I'm inspired by your center as well and the ability to reach out and connect uh, across our centers and to strengthen across the world uh, interest in the study of, of wisdom and its relationship to things like leadership and business, its application. Excellent. Yeah. So let's start, uh, if you allow me, uh, Howard, to um, speak a bit about your, your center. So what was the, the uh, when you, at that time, it was, I think a few years ago, you decided to, 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 to set up this center. What was the motivation that you had? And uh, can you tell us about that? And maybe the, some of the activities, some examples uh, of activities that you're currently like, uh, having uh, through the center. Yeah. So it's, it's a great question, Sarie, and I appreciate it. The center emerged out of a long history of funding research in wisdom. And it started uh, in 2007, we actually were approached by the Templeton Foundation uh, to run a competition, a grant competition to give away $2 million uh, to 20 wow. some mm -hmm. scholars and researchers who were interested in wisdom. And at the time we sort of said, no untenured person is going to ever risk their career on studying wisdom. And yet we received <laughs> hundreds hundreds, 400 and some letters of intent from around the world. Uh, and we did end up funding uh, 23 projects uh, for $2 million to study wisdom from areas like classics and history, psychology, neuroscience, computer science, etc. cetera. So, um, so that's, where we, that's where we started. But the idea of the center itself was that we should do several things. One is we should support research in wisdom. That is Okay. Uh, when we did that original project, none of the money came to the University of Chicago for research support, just to support people elsewhere. And since then, the center has, has started to actually encourage researchers at Chicago right. to do research on wisdom and to reach out and connect to people in Israel, people in India, to people in Italy, uh, to collaborate on research and wisdom. So, so we started the center in part to support research to support research collaborations on the one hand, but on the other hand, to serve as a clearinghouse for information. So the website, the newsletter, uh, that's where we sort of uh, post information about papers, conferences, uh, discussions, where people can write columns to talk about wisdom because the idea was to disseminate uh, wisdom research information and understanding of wisdom uh, in order to support other people uh, engaging in wisdom and then ultimately to think about how wisdom can be applied in the real world. Okay. And uh, so um, uh, this second dimension about how wisdom can be applied in the real world, uh, is it a recent, let's say, kind of uh, direction your center has taken? Because as I could understand from what you're saying, it was primarily, let's say, devoted to, to wisdom research and funding, but not especially in so, the application. Yeah. So you're right in some sense, but even in the very first projects, 
So going back to 2007, one of the projects that was supported was how, how to use wisdom for financial counselors talking about intergenerational transfer of wealth. So let's say I'm a business person. I've created a, a, a very fine company and I want my kids to get involved in that company in some fashion. How does the count? So there are these people, these these uh, uh, financial advisors, who help people in, uh, do this intergenerational intergenerational transfer. And the question that this person was studying was, how can wisdom inform that? So even from the first, there were applications involved. Now, exactly. More so recently, that would be, yeah. So uh, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, go ahead. That's okay. Go ahead. What I was thinking is that um, it means that the research has, of course, like conceptualization of wisdom and uh, building up the theoretical aspect or framework or model. But also, even since the start, it was also like, preoccupied with uh, some application, right? Yeah. That's right. Uh, the, actually, the first project in 2007 was called Defining Wisdom because there wasn't a clear definition that could be uh, reached, uh, you know, religion philosophers, even some psychologists had ideas about what wisdom was, but there was not a common definition. And so right. the notion was to explore that across different fields. But uh, on our original uh, board of advisors, our board of advisors for the center, uh, we yes. had Harry Davis from the Booth Business School who runs the Center oh. for Leadership. Um, okay. So he was part of the original center. Um, we had philosophers, we had economists, so we've always been interested in how wisdom is important in the world. Wonderful. Okay. And um, uh, so now, Howard, uh, I read that uh, uh, in, uh, I mean, uh, quite recently in 2019, a group of wisdom researchers, international group of wisdom researchers, uh, just gathered in Toronto and uh, they formed what is the, what was called the Wisdom Task Force. So what was the idea behind this? And uh, as I understand, there are many disciplines which are like working on wisdom, as you are mentioning. So first question would be, why meeting and bringing all these people together? And was it easy to bring people who come from their own, let's say, kind of lands? <laughs> So that's a, that's a great question. I can say that in 2007, when we started the first um, RFP, the, you know, the request for funding, when we gave away the $2 million, mm -hmm. we had quarterly meetings of all the PIs, all the principal investigators. They got together um, on the phone. We had a, a phone meeting of, of 20 some people. Uh, right. This is before Zoom. And we talked about the issues. And in fact, the group of PIs, the group of investigators, decided a subgroup should be created to study the history and philosophy of wisdom and another subgroup to study ways of measuring wisdom. And out of that grew what we used to call the Wisdom Forum. So when right. we had funding from Templeton, we would have two annual meetings, bringing together researchers interested in wisdom together to talk. And at, through that set of interactions, I got to meet uh, people like um, Bob Sternberg and Judith Gluck, um, <clears throat> Monica Ardell, who you know, um, and yes. and those groups would get together. So Igor Grossman was one of the members of one of the people that we met, uh, who was a young uh, investigator, psychologist working on wisdom research and cross cultural studies. And he's at Toronto, and he got together a group and invited me and Monica and other people to come together for the very reason that we were just talking about. That is, there are all these people studying wisdom and they all had different kinds of definitions of wisdom. And so the question for the group was really, where are the commonalities? In other right. words, is everybody different? Is there no commonality or what are the common threads? And so a survey was created and sent out to wisdom researchers and there was discussion about how to analyze that. But more than that was to try to say, what is the core that is in common, regardless of where research, researchers come from to study wisdom? Wonderful. That's fascinating. So the, the, it was a smooth process. How, how is very interesting? Are these wisdom researchers, are they wise themselves when they enter into this kind of... Uh... <laughs> well, well, the conundrum facing all of us is that nobody wise 
uh, claims that they're wise. <laughs> uh, so I think it, it would be foolish of me on its face to, uh, to say that. But I think, uh, I think that what was yeah. interesting about this is um, one, there's a kind of intellectual humility in acknowledging that philosophy doesn't own the concept, religion doesn't own the concept, but there's something to be learned from all of us. And I think that's a fundamental truth is that, you know, on the one hand, we have intuitions, we have ideas, there's a kind of folk psychology, folk notions of what wisdom can be. And when you look at, say, the wisdom, the notion of wisdom, say, in Native Americans, uh, you know, or you look in Southeast Asia at notions of wisdom in folk tales, or you look at what um, people on the street think wisdom is. There's a commonality of sorts among those things. And the idea here was to get people who study wisdom together to, to find the commonality. So you ask, is it smooth? Well, what's interesting to me about that is that first project in 2007 brought together historians and economists and neuroscientists and psychologists and computer scientists yes. and musicians mm -hmm. to talk about wisdom. And that wow. is actually wow. wonderful. It, it was great because we all had a common goal of trying to understand something that is perhaps aspirational for humanity. Where could we, how could we be better as humans? And so there were differences of opinion, but never disputes. And so people came to the notion to work together and that was true in Toronto. Everybody came together. It's true that there were, again, differences. So, for example, um, yeah. some some people there. That paper that I uh, I showed you um, mm. about the Toronto uh, project, that mm. paper actually had a number of responses to it from people like uh, uh, Bob Sternberg and Monica Ardell. They they wrote their own responses because they took issue with it. Um, yeah. uh, uh, Christian Christensen uh, at uh, Birmingham, for example, uh, wrote a paper on phronesis, um, basically taking issue with the term moral grounding that appears in the paper. Um, yeah. But nobody was sort of saying, you guys are stupid or you're doing the <laughs> wrong thing. Um, one thing that was interesting is that the common model that emerged from that group. Yeah. So we can really come to that. Yes. Yeah. That, that mm -hmm. wasn't really intended as, as a as a proposed model, but rather, what are the common assumptions underlying all the theories? Okay. And so what was important about that is, what do we agree on? That was what the purpose was. What do people agree on constitutes wisdom? And then the things we don't agree on are basically things we can test in one way. And the things we do agree on, we can test and elaborate on in another way. Absolutely. Yeah. So can you tell us more, Howard, about this? Um, you know, what are these commonalities that you have uh, arrived at? I mean, uh, that must be a momentous task. And what was uh, absolutely surprising and fascinating for me, it comes to two basic, let's say, kind of uh, uh, elements and uh, which are termed moral grounding or uh, moral orientation. And the second one, metacognition. So uh, can you please unpack each of them? I mean... Uh, the way you would like to, so so our uh, let's say listeners can understand what it is because I think there is a lot here to learn from this uh, these terms. Yeah. So I I think that's that's a really important observation is that on the one hand moral grounding is a vague term. What is yeah. moral? What is grounding? How do they come together? What grounding means in this sense is that the motivation and the goals of wisdom are related to sort of what we would call moral virtues. If you think about Aristotle, or if you just think about pro-sociality, what does it mean to care about other people? Okay. What is the importance of other people in making decisions? So in many cases, when we make a decision, let's say you decide you want to invest in some stock, you say, I want to invest in this stock because I want a good return on my investment. Or you say, I want to start this business because I want to make money and I want to build something of my own. In those cases, you're talking about me only. But some people, when they invest in stocks, they invest only in green stocks, stocks right. that help the environment. They don't want to, say, invest in arms manufacturers. They don't want to invest in polluters. Um, so their motivation there is morally grounded. That is, they're not just looking to make money, but they're looking to make money in a way that has an 
element of morality. Uh, in the United States, we have something called B Corp, uh, benefit yes. corps. Yeah, you and have the benefit. same kind of movement also in uh, in France with this uh, uh, mm. uh, uh, similar idea, which has emerged recently. Yeah. So, what so is this in the United of, States, yeah. you know, mm. stockholders can actually sue a company if, say, they do something good for the community that doesn't specifically and directly help the bottom line for a normal corporation. But benefits corps can help their workers. They can help the community. They can do a lot of things that are investing in the long term health and well-being of the company, because a company will only survive to the extent that its workers thrive. Et cetera, et cetera. So, so that notion of benefits corp is a kind of moral grounding. Now, whether it's wise or not, that's a different issue. But the notion of moral grounding here is that yeah. a decision has to take into account the impact on other people. It has to take into account the long term and, and short term effects and benefits for other people, uh, as well as oneself. And of course, other people, your family can't thrive if you suffer, right? Your family yeah. needs you to do well, so you can't just ignore yourself. You have to balance those things. And that's a very Aristotelian notion of balancing a set of uh, motivations. And so moral grounding, from my perspective, takes into account things like compassion, gratitude, generosity, trust, honesty, um, courage of a kind. So what would be, uh, I mean, you need not give some names, but uh, in this political sphere, what would be your views, not on such and such leaders? I mean, if you don't want to go in that, it's okay for me. But what would be the observation you have about the political sphere? And are they morally grounded? Or do we see an overall trend, whether it's in US or over the world to go to some of the leaders which are like really lacking this uh, fundamental characteristic of wisdom, right? I think that's right. I mean, I, so I, I think what you're saying about the problem of some leaders who may be autocratic or dictatorial, who are serving their own needs in a very narrow constituency's needs without considering mm -hmm. the say good of the population at large, without considering the weakest elements and most poor off, the disadvantaged, without considering other countries. So for example, uh, Thomas Piketty wrote a book about uh, capital and the yeah. fact that there are disparities amongst countries in terms of wealth and well-being. And within countries, there are disparities of wealth and well-being. And we know that some political leaders seek actually to enhance those disparities, making the well-off better, making themselves better, and ignoring the lower elements of society that are doing poorly, the ones that need the most help. And so that notion is a fundamental problem that if you look at some of the books that have been written in recent years about problems with democracy, say Anne Applebaum's uh, book about uh, democracy, she points out that some of the stereotypes um, are really not correct, that it's not, you know, sort of a, a grand segment of the population that is simply disenfranchised that is feeding these political leaders who have autocratic tendencies. But in fact, some of the elites go along with that because they feel disadvantaged, relatively speaking. So what is what is this, you know, pro-sociality, what does this moral grounding mean in terms of, of leaders? Well, I'm not sure I can point to any particular leaders where we can assess truly their underlying motivations and aspirations. But you can see the difference between a leader who is concerned about, and it may be for political reasons, right? They could be concerned about a segment of the population that is disadvantaged for political reasons. Um, but nonetheless, they are concerned about the greater well-being. So what you look for is politicians who care about others, who are not just their own, who are not just their voting bloc, but who are disadvantaged. A politician for all people, even those who didn't vote for them, would be an example. Okay. So it's a very nice example. I mean, it's really to, maybe I, what I love in what you're saying, Howard, is that it, it helps us to, uh, to see that this wisdom is not something which is esoteric or disconnected from reality. It's like uh, our day-to-day -day living and uh, 
the basis upon which uh, we are also affected by the decision of others, right? And so that's wonderful. The, 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 what about this uh, uh, second uh, characteristic that uh, this uh, uh, of this common mo- model of wisdom, which is metacognition? So cognition about cognition. Well, what does it mean exactly? Yeah. So that's a that's a it's an interesting problem. So the the term metacognition, as used in the paper that that I pointed you to. Um, it's yeah. actually not the way a cognitive scientist would use it typically, or a cognitive psychologist. Yeah, but because you're you a cognitive right? scientist, basically, right? <laughs> That's true. I, 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 I own up to the fact that I'm trained as a cognitive psychologist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but what's important about this notion of metacognition, it's, it's exactly what you say, thinking about thinking. So on the one hand, how can you care about other people if you don't know about other people? And what does it mean to know about other people? One way of knowing about other people is to take their perspective. So Valerie Tiberius, who's a philosopher, wrote a book about um, the reflective life and, and wisdom. And what she said is that, you know, we often make assumptions about other people's needs and wants. When right. we make a choice, we might think, oh, will my mom like it if I do this? Will my daughter like it if I move to this other city and take her away from all of her friends? Oh, those are easy things. No, I can say she won't like it. But to say that somebody will or won't like something is not the same thing as feeling it. And this is where the notion of metacognition becomes different in different theories. Tiberius says to be really wise, it's not enough to say what someone else would think or feel but you have to experience it yourself. You have to be in their shoes for the moment. And that's a very tricky kind of cognition. You have to take their perspective the way they would take it, not from an external stereotyped view, where I assume, for example, um, because you're from this group, you're like this. So for example, if I think about poor people, and if I Mm -hmm. think poor people are uneducated and dirty, that's a stereotype. And it's not right. a true it's not a true statement. It may have some statistical basis, but it's not a true statement that applies to everyone. So taking the perspective of somebody who's poor, what does it mean to have insufficient resources? Sandil Mulanathan, who's a, an economist at the University of Chicago, was at Harvard, was a MacArthur Fellow, did a mm-hmm. series of studies with rich uh, Princeton undergraduates. And what he did is he played a game with them where the students had to had a certain amount of time to solve a problem, but right. they could borrow time from a future problem to solve a current problem if it got <laughs> too hard and needed more time. Uh-huh. And one group of students was given more than enough time, and they always made good decisions about their time allocation. One group of students was shorted on time. They didn't have enough time to solve some problems. And they started stealing time from the future and found themselves in worse and worse shape. And the point of this study was that People who are poor, who have insufficient resources to solve problems, it's not that they're stupid. It's that the resources make demands on their decision making in a certain way. And Sandil then went to India and he studied farmers and farmers have good seasons and bad seasons. And what he found is that they make better decisions in good seasons than bad seasons. It's not that poor people make stupid decisions because they're stupid. Resource insufficiency has an impact. Well, all of that is to say that how do you understand what a poor person's life is like? How can you take perspective? Because we have stereotypes. We have to get beyond those stereotypes. And so metacognition means doing what Sandil did. Do a study, whatever, by conversation, by asking questions, by trying to understand how people actually feel, what it is like for them to be them. And that's taking perspective. And that's an important aspect of this metacognition. And the other side of it is reflection. That is to just be able to think deeply and seriously to see where the pitfalls of cognition are because we have biases to identify those biases and not be tricked by them. Okay. Just one question, Howard. It's interesting that um, what I heard, you are speaking about thinking about thinking, but at the same time, you are speaking about feeling. And it's almost as though you're uh, bringing the word compassion there, right? So th- does it mean that there is some 
connection between these two aspects of metacognition and this moral grounding? Or is it, uh, what is it exactly here? That's, that's a really important issue. And it's a theoretical issue, not a, there's no, I can't give you truth about this, but I can give you okay. my belief about it. And my yeah. belief about it is that when we talk about moral grounding, it depends on perspective taken. It depends on being able to understand other people's positions. In other words, so there's a classic, you know, in the, in the, in the Christian theology, there's a classic notion about uh, do unto others as they would do unto you. Right, um, which is, which then, is one uh, in all, I mean, so many uh, with, uh, traditions, uh, wisdom traditions. Yeah. Exactly. There's yeah. an older saying, which comes from Jewish theology, which I don't often uh, uh, refer to, but there's a story that Rabbi Akiba was faced by somebody who was a skeptic. And the skeptic said, I'm going to stand on one foot. Now teach me all of, of Jewish law. And what <laughs> Rabbi Akiba said, in response to that was, do not do to someone else what you don't want done yeah. to yourself. Absolutely. And that's an important distinction because the activity of not doing bad things to other people at least means it's not bad for somebody. But doing to someone else what you think is good to be done to you could lead you, for example, to have laws about abortion or who you can right. marry or who's clean and who's not clean, what you can do. So proscriptions that you think are honorable and important and moral for yourself being applied to other people are problematic if you don't have their perspective. And that's why metacognition becomes very important for compassion, I think. Great. Um, I think there is more to metacognition than just look at like this ability to to adopt or to have this the different perspective. There is one, I, I know that uh, you are quite fond of that, and I, I believe it's an essential element also of this metacognition, which is this uh, humility, intellectual humility. So would you say a few words about that, maybe illustrate it by um, uh, some example or some story, uh, Howard? Absolutely. So... The paper talks about intellectual humility, but in our center, we actually talk about epistemic humility. And the right. reason we make a distinction is that intellectual humility is knowing what I know and knowing what I don't know. And why is that important? Well, if I meet somebody who comes from a, a different uh, background than mine, you know, I have to establish common ground. I have to say, what do we know that's in common? But I still don't know what I don't know about you. And what's interesting to me is, um, so uh, in the United States Armed Forces, there are what are called special operators. And these are people who like do special assignments undercover, underground and whatever. They go into other countries and they often come from like small towns in the United States and they've right. never been out of the United States. They might have come from some small town in Alabama and never met somebody who speaks a different language, much less their language with a different accent. And it turns <laughs> out that the way that the military trained these people is to give them stereotypes about the countries they were going to, which is wow. stupid. And in a meeting, so the United States has 17 intelligence agencies. And I was at a meeting of the 17 intelligence agencies representatives. And what they were saying, what the heads of the agencies were basically saying is, we need to understand social sciences. We need to understand people yeah. better than we do. And the best way to do that is to ask questions, but not stupid questions. And so you want to ask open-ended questions. So the notion of intellectual humility is knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know, knowing where expertise is. And we use the term epistemic humility for a broader sense than intellectual book knowledge. So intellectual humility really seems to be about like, Do you know about astronomy and astrophysics? Well, a little bit, but not so much. So I know what questions they ask. On the other hand, do I know what the culture of Vietnam is like in villages? I don't actually know what a marriage ceremony looks like there. And I wouldn't want to transgress local customs. And so if I were a doctor, for example, and I had a patient who came from Southeast Asia, and the family is saying to me as a doctor, Don't tell him he has a deathly disease. Yeah. 
because mm -hmm. he will die sooner and you will not have a chance to treat him. Mm -hmm. I have to use that knowledge from the family to inform my ignorance about that culture and shape the way in which I interact with them. That's how epistemic humility, having humility about culture and values, as well as knowledge uh, is important. Yeah. And uh, of course, in a business context, I mean, uh, the recent events which unfolded with this pandemic have, uh, I mean, have thrown many of these uh, big companies with their very powerful, let's say, thinking algorithm and machines in total, let's say, distress, right? Of course, they're rebounding, right? But uh, maybe that was a, a clear message where they thought that they were in control and they could like address anything and everything and with their resources and intellectual capabilities, which they have. I mean, uh, there maybe it was like bringing them to earth, right? This humility, yeah? to the ground reality of, yeah, I don't know everything, but it's okay. And uh, once I acknowledge what I don't know, I look for ways, let's say, to uncover this uh, prejudices or this wrong beliefs, which can cloud my vision of things, right? Yeah. I think and, that's absolutely right. So yeah. new experiences that are unexpected can be responded to in one of two ways. Hmm. You can respond to them in a stereotyped way that you would have responded to anything in the past and mm -hmm. thereby make mistakes. Or you can say, I don't know what this thing is, and we need to understand it better before we take action. And I right. think that's the critical difference in epistemic humility. Okay. Uh, Howard, I, um, uh, I had often this question... Uh, and maybe you can help uh, our listeners to, um, uh, to, to have some clarity on that. They say, yeah, but wisdom is like nothing like uh, intelligence. And the way you are speaking about the, the, uh, all this common model is like, it looks like really a capacity to think through uh, situation, events and people, character and so on and assess and take the best step I can. So how intelligence is like different from... Uh, uh, from wisdom here. So I, I think that's, that's a, I start with that question actually when I give talks often. <laughs> it is I try to distinguish uh, intelligence and creativity from wisdom. And the way that I do it is if you think about what's measured on an intelligence test, mm -hmm. um, intelligence tests do things like they measure something about your ability to say synonyms for words, your ability to solve certain kinds of problems, Right. Um, but they're not problems of a moral character. They're not mm. problems of, say, choosing between um, the well-being of, of a small group of people who are your family and a very large group of people who you don't know, but you know, right. many times larger. That's a tough problem for anybody. How do you make those choices? Or even a simple problem. So uh, Schwartz and Sharp have this example of um, your friend is getting married um, and she puts on a dress and she asks you, how does my dress look? And the example that they give is you could be honest because honest is a very <laughs> Or you could be compassionate and you could say, you know, why? So how do you balance honesty and compassion in circumstances like that? So this and is not the domain of IQ. Yeah, absolutely. That's not, you can't be smart about that, right? There's no <laughs> smartness. But, and you can't even be creative. I mean, you could, you could tell a story, you could try to deflect. But what's interesting to me is my colleague, Candace Vogler, who's a philosopher, came up with an answer that was not in Schwartz and Sharp, which I thought was actually a wise answer. And that is, you say, all brides look beautiful. Uh -huh. <laughs> What she's really asking is, how do I look in this dress? And your answer is not about the dress, Absolutely. but about your friend getting married and that she's happy and it's a beautiful occasion and she looks beautiful. And that's the difference between wisdom and smarts. Smarts is like, oh, do I decide between being honest and lying? How do I make that choice? Well, it's always better to be honest or something like that. Whereas wisdom finds a better path, a better solution, and one that cares about the person and solves the problem without lying. Yeah. And um, there is another, thanks, Howard, that was like uh, very clear. There is another, let's say, potential uh, area, I mean, in terms of words of uh, confusion, which is 
between metacognition, which can could be equated to some, some form of rationality, right? And rationality, you have a certain goal orientation. Like, let's imagine now your goal orientation is to maximize the well-being of your employee in your company or your community or society or whatever. So in what way this uh, rationality is uh, different or similar to wisdom? Then? So I think that's, that's an important question. So one of the things that's interesting is researchers have actually distinguished between intelligence and rationality, right? Rationality is a reasoning process. Intelligence is the way we solve problems and sort of the, ah. the skills we have in solving problems. But mm -hmm. rationality is about reasoning. And of course, wisdom requires intelligence and it requires rationality. But rationality is not inherently morally grounded. So you can be very rational. So the people at Enron, uh, which was an energy okay. company, that did an energy yeah. trading uh, in California, they were entirely rational about setting up essentially a market um, where they made lots and lots of money until they didn't. And they were totally immoral. That is, they did not uh, think about the impact on the population of California. They didn't think about yeah. their own workers. And ultimately, the heads of the company went to jail. Kenneth Lay, I think, died in jail or something. So the point is that you can be very rational and you can be totally immoral. You could think of a psychopath. A psychopath can be very clever and rational about plotting the victim's uh, demise. Absolutely. We have so, uh, some example in the, uh, some movies like uh, Silence of Lambs and so on, like amazing genius psychopaths, right? Yeah. That's right. And very rational. That is, they know how to predict people's behavior They know how to plan for alternatives. They can't. Get, they won't get caught, and yet they're not moral. There's no morality right. there, so it's not wisdom. Okay, great. Uh, now let's um, uh, end uh, by one uh, important element, which is question, which is about the development of uh, this wisdom. Uh, so first of all, is it something which can be developed, uh, or is it something which is inherited? And if it can be developed, how you go about it? Uh... <laughs> you know, that, so one of the core themes of the center at Chicago, Center for Practical Wisdom, is under the notion that experience can increase wisdom. And the reason that that's important is, you know, that in some, in some cultures, the aged are considered to be wise. But we can sort of think about some, shall we say, foolish old folks, and we can think about some pretty wise young folks. So Absolutely, Greta Thunberg, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. she's an example of, of green advocacy. Greta Thunberg, some people would think she's wise. Other people think she's evil. That's a different debate. But I think right. the issue is that wisdom doesn't inhere in aging necessarily, but we have certain kinds of experiences. Now, what's interesting to me is there's been some research about um, when you face life challenges, when you have a terrible outcome, let's say you're a soldier in the war and all of your, your, your unit is, is massacred and you're the only one that survives, it's a traumatic experience. And we all know about post-traumatic post stress. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it just adversely affects you. And yet there's a, a Nietzschean kind of notion that what doesn't kill us makes us stronger And that's been applied in psychology to some degree. The research actually suggests that it's not true that everybody who has an, a traumatic experience benefits from it. Necessarily when you grow wise, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Some people mm -hmm. do. And so on the one hand, the question is, you know, can experience make us wiser? For example, you have a friend. You think you understand what your friend's feeling about some situation. You jump to those conclusions and your friend is hurt by the way you jump to those conclusions and you mm -hmm. learn from that. Now, you, you repair your friendship, but you learn from that. You say, oh, I shouldn't have made those assumptions. Some people learn from that. Other people go on jumping to conclusions because they don't listen to the information they're given. They can't take perspective. Right. They can't engage in metacognition and reflection about where things went wrong. In order to develop then you need to have epistemic humility. You have to realize there are limits to what you know, and you have to have the curiosity 
an interest in improving, in using metacognition and reflection to improve. So I think that in order to benefit from, it's not that everybody with the same experience will de develop, say, moral grounding or the virtues. They're not going to develop compassion. You know, a lot of Germans did not develop compassion by seeing the concentration camps necessarily, but some did. Why do you develop compassion? Because you understand that there were adverse consequences and you feel the impact of those consequences for other people. And right. so I think that you can develop from experiences. You can actually give people certain experiences in some ways and perhaps in that way shape the development of wisdom. But people have to have some, shall we say, pre-preparation for it. They have right. to be able to recognize the limits of their knowledge, that they want to take perspective, etc. Yeah, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I know, Howard, that you have been teaching um, to the students at the university at uh, Chicago a course on Gandhi. And can you tell us how, how do you go about that uh, and what elements of uh, metacognition and how do you do that? How do you develop and how do you assess that they have grown in that aspect? Well, it, it's a... That's... To be clear, the course is not on Gandhi, much as I would love to have taught a course. <laughs> the course is actually called Understanding Wisdom. Excellent. Um, okay. And, and we use Richard Attenborough's movie about Gandhi as a kind of uh, cartoon, if you will. Right. But one that can be shared by all the observers of the movie. Why is that movie important? Well, it's not that, I mean, the life of Gandhi is very inspiring for many people. And it's a very important set of stories because the narrative in that movie, even if it, shall we say, caricatures the life of Gandhi, it makes very important illustrations. So one of the examples is early on um, in the movie, Gandhi is traveling in South Africa in the train. Uh, right. and the conductor comes and basically tells him uh, because of his race, he can't be in a compartment in the train. And he says, I'm a lawyer. I have a ticket. What are you saying? I paid for this. <laughs> and and the conductor basically says, you want to see what that's worth? Given your skin and kicks him off the train. What's important about that is Gandhi did not know what he did not know about <laughs> traveling on trains in South Africa. And he learned the hard way. Now, what's interesting is there's a later uh, example in the story where he's walking with um, a reverend. And he's walking on a, on a sidewalk and there is some local South African toughs there confronting him. And he basically says, he, you could say that one way of learning from that example on the train is you should back down. You don't want to get beaten up. Yeah. But Gandhi learned that there are some times you're supposed to get beaten up. That is, if you back down, you give up some of yourself. And so the contrast between those two episodes, one where he stands up to the toughs and one where he gets thrown off the train, has to do with two kinds of things. When do you resist and when do you not resist? And so do you, uh, you sorry to interrupt, uh, Howard, I, I, I'm sorry, I am fascinating by what you are saying, but then you, the students are exposed to these two scenarios. So how do you bring them? Is it a process of reflection or discussion? How, how does it happen? So we have them watch the movie uh, and we t give them assignments. Find an example of epistemic humility, where it succeeds, where it fails. Right. And then discuss. So small groups meet, they discuss and they argue what happens when epistemic humility fails? What happens when it succeeds? What did Gandhi do afterwards? What did, how did it benefit him? How did it benefit the movement? So we take examples like that. We take examples of compassion. We take examples of perspective taking. So for example, Gandhi comes to India, comes back to India from South Africa, and he says, I am going to learn what it's like to live in the village. I'm going to go learn what it's like. That's perspective taking. And we ask students, what has happened because of that? What does he learn from that experience? And in the later example, he actually takes a tray from a servant and starts serving the people in the room himself. Wow. So he shows that he's learned what it means to be of a different class. Wow. And he tries to illustrate that to other people. Okay. Wonderful. Wow. Okay. 
it gives me a lot of ideas. I am sure the listeners also. And um, how are I'm watching the time? And uh, I, I would love to continue this conversation. I'm sure we'll have some other opportunities. And uh, I know you will also uh, do one of the research presentation as well. So we'll have this uh, again a time together, a very uh, meaningful and uh, very enjoy uh, enjoyable time together. So thanks a lot again for uh, being with us, and uh, we'll capture catch up very soon. Thanks, Howard. Well, thank you, Surya, for inviting me, and and thank you for this conversation. I really appreciate it. You were listening to Sapiens, a special podcast series by SPJN Institute of Management and Research, Mumbai, brought to you by SPJMR Center for Wisdom and Leadership, produced by Vinita Dwivedi and the communications team.